Hi everyone! Before finishing up our discussion on quantum operators, I want to discuss one more very important class of operators, unitary operators. These operators are fairly intuitive, and they'll become foundational to the notion of change in quantum mechanics. With that, let's get into it. Like we did when introducing Hermitian operators, let's start with the inner product of two vectors. Here's what I want to know. Is there an operator u such that when I transform both vectors by u, the inner product stays the same? Remember that the inner product is a generalized dot product. So let's use that for some intuition and look at the alternate formula for the dot product, which is equal to the product of the lengths times the cosine of the angle. Well, with this alternate formula, we can see that we are intuitively asking if we have an operator u such that after transforming both vectors, the lengths and the angle between them stays the same. When we frame the question this way, it's clear that one transformation that satisfies this is a simple rotation. The lengths stay the same and the relative angle is preserved. Now, rotations are just one type of operation that preserve the inner product. And in general, we call operators that preserve the inner product unitary operators. A unitary operator is defined as any operator that satisfies the following property. Its Hermitian conjugate is equal to its inverse. Now, it isn't immediately clear that this property implies inner product preservation. So let's prove it. Let's start with an inner product and apply u to both vectors. Let's then pull out the right operator. If we want to switch the left operator to act on the right, remember that we just use the Hermitian conjugate. The Hermitian conjugate is equal to the inverse. Hence, we get u times its inverse, which by definition must equal the identity. Hence, the inner product is equal to its original value. Although unitary operators are an abstract concept, I think you should always keep the intuition that these operators are just generalized rotations. They move vectors all over the place, but they always intuitively keep the lengths and corresponding angles the same. Before connecting this to quantum mechanics, let's lay down one more fundamental property of unitary operators. Let's say omega is a normalized eigenvector of unitary operator u. Since omega is normalized, its inner product with itself must be equal to 1. Now, let's act u on omega and take its inner product again. Since omega is an eigenvector, u will simply return the corresponding eigenvalue. The right slot of the inner product is linear, so we can pull out lambda. And the left slot is antilinear, so we pull out the complex conjugate of lambda. This inner product is then equal to 1, and remember that a complex number times its conjugate is equal to its magnitude squared. Now, u preserves the inner product, so we have that this must be equal to the inner product without u, which is just 1. So we have just derived one of the fundamental properties of unitary operators. The eigenvalues of a unitary operator must have magnitude 1, also known as unit complex numbers. This is where the unitary name comes from all the eigenvalues have unit length. This property should also make intuitive sense. Eigenvalues tell you how much the operator scales its eigenvector. So if we think of unitary operators as generalized rotations, they intuitively shouldn't change the length of their eigenvectors. Therefore, it makes sense that the eigenvalues have to have unit length. Great, so why do we care about unitary operators in quantum mechanics? Well, what do inner products represent in quantum mechanics? 99% of the time, inner products are used to calculate probabilities. So, since unitary operators preserve the inner product, if we act a unitary operator on every vector in our space, the probability of getting a particular measurement wouldn't change. Likewise, the total probability of our state would still be equal to 1. So, the big realization is that unitary operators conserve probability in quantum mechanics. Hopefully, I don't have to convince you that conserving probability is a big deal. I mean, think about all the things you want to do to a particle, shown in white, and its system, shown in blue, while still having its total probability be conserved. We may want to take our particle and its system and rotate it, or we may want to take our particle and its system and move it over, or, most importantly, we may want to study how our particle evolves in time. 
In all of these processes, we would hope that the total probability is always equal to 1. Hence, you may expect that things like the rotation operator, translation operator, and time evolution operator will have to be unitary, since these transformations should all conserve probability. In two episodes, we'll flesh this idea out when we derive the Schrodinger equation and prove that time evolution must be unitary. With that, we've covered everything we need to know about unitary operators. There's a lot more to say about them, but we've covered the fundamentals that we need to derive the Schrodinger equation. They're fairly simple and intuitive, right? Next episode, we'll take a quick pit stop into generators in classical physics, using the Lagrangian framework. Generators are always brought up when deriving the Schrodinger equation and the momentum operator, but I haven't seen anyone actually take the time to talk about what they intuitively are in classical physics. Once we have that, we'll finally see how generators and unitary evolution come together into the infamous equation. With that, thank you so much for watching. As always, let me know if you have any questions. Hope to see you in the rest of the series.